This is a tough video to make. Okay, these are both arguably two of the best, most premium phones on the market right now, which is why this comparison is so hard for me. They're both fantastic, but let's get real here, okay? Which one should you get? Okay, let's get right into the weeds here. Now, first thing we're gonna talk about is build quality. Now, both phones are honestly fantastic. I'm really glad that both phones don't have that curved edge screen that Samsung used to do before. And because of that, I used to get like all these like ghost touches sometimes and it was less than ideal. There's been some questionable stuff that's happened, uh, you know, links that shouldn't have been clicked. Even without the curved screen, the phone feels fantastic to hold because they still do a little bit of a curvature on the edges, which really allows the phone to fit nicely in your hands when you're grabbing it. As for the iPhone, now this is a key upgrade this year. Apple did make their phone slightly more you know, sharp edged than the iPhone 14 Pro Max. I remember the iPhone 14 Pro Max was boxy, right? Like when you have held it, you could feel the corners and the edges. They did taper them a little bit this time around. So it does feel much better to hold. But one thing that Apple did do this year also is they decided to put titanium on their bezels and this allows the phone to be lighter and more durable. But looks wise, this thing with the brushed titanium all along the sides, I gotta give it to Apple. This looks really great this year. However, in terms of actual comfort in hand, I still think the S23 Ultra takes it. There's just something about the shape and the body of this phone. It does feel a little bit taller than it needs to be. Now, before I discuss some of the other intricacies of these phones, I wanna talk about the special features. I know exactly what you guys are thinking right now. Holy crap, those, those wallpapers are sick. Well, I'll let you in on a little secret. We good? Okay, now I, I'm gonna go quickly sit back again. So basically, I actually shot those wallpapers all on this iPhone 14 Pro Max. Pretty cool, so I have them for sale. So if you're interested, then uh, link in the description down below. I'd appreciate your support if, if you guys are down for some cool wallpapers. But yeah, let me get back, let me. Now, firstly, with the Samsung, it's the S Pen. Like, I can't tell you guys how much I love this S Pen. So whether I'm using this to help me edit videos on CapCut on the phone, or sign contracts on the go, or to even do silly markups to send to friends, this thing came in clutch. The S Pen can also work remotely as a camera trigger, which is super neat as well. Now, where Apple fights back, and I think they have an edge here, is the ecosystem. I still think Apple has the slight lead here, and that is mainly because of third-party support. A lot of companies when building apps will design specifically for iOS first before they bring it over to Android. It's kind of annoying. S23 Ultra though does support fast charging up to 45 watts, whereas the iPhone 15 Pro Max now can get up to nearly 30 watts due to the USB-C finally, but yeah, still not as fast as the Samsung. The S23 Ultra can also power share, which the iPhone cannot do. There's something oddly satisfying and hilarious about reverse charging your AirPods Pro or even the iPhone itself on a Samsung. The world's most expensive wireless charger. <laughs> Also look, multitasking wise, I gotta give it to Samsung. They kill it here. I think Apple has a ways to go here. Like, why don't we have the split screen thing yet? I mean, the space is there. But look, the iPhone has one key feature that I absolutely love, and that's called MagSafe. I think it's a huge differentiating factor for the iPhone, and I am so glad that they have invented this. Okay, so speaking of MagSafe, I absolutely love how popular it's gotten in third-party marketplaces and brands are making all sorts of cool and incredible stuff. Q, the sponsor of this portion of the video, Moft. These guys actually make some of the most unique and helpful accessories. These products are part of their MagSafe collection and let's take a look at my favorite one which is called the Snap Invisible Phone Tripod Stand. This thing is super inconspicuous and it's nice and thin, but then opens up to give a lot of height and elevation to your phone. This is super handy if you wanna use this as a tripod on the go and just look how thin and like low profile it is, or you can use it to elevate your device on your desk, or you can even use it as a selfie stick. The hinge on this is quite strong, which allows you to basically adjust the angle of your phone for your viewing pleasure. It also seems that they've increased the strength of their magnet here because this thing seems even stronger than before. It's not going anywhere. And you can even pair it with one of their cases like this Moft MagSafe case and you should be good to go. Now, if you wanted something that could also hold some cards, they also have the snap on phone stand and wallet. So you can basically store your credit cards in here, but you also get this neat little stand and you can place your phone in either portrait or landscape. Moth makes some really cool origami style accessories like this. So if you wanna check any of them out, they're gonna be in the description down below. I'm like shooting shots of like these phones right now and my hands are like really dry. I literally have like 
sort for the mess. I literally have this like in my studio, which seems questionable at first, but when you see my hands, you will understand the reasons. Ready to go. All right, now let's talk about displays. Now displays are a big deal because that's your primary method of input and output on these phones. And at first glance, they both have great OLED panels. So everything pops and it's nice and large and they have the 120 Hertz refresh rate, which is an absolute must. The more you start to use these devices, the more you notice the design language and the subtle differences that both of these companies are focused on. And you can really, and it's really apparent with their screens. The flat panel on the iPhone feels a bit uniform with their dynamic island cut out above, which blends in quite well. Whereas the Samsung on the other hand feels like they are trying to pack as much content into their screen size as possible. Much noticeably smaller cutout up top with their hole punch design. It's taller, more rectangular rather than the curved look on the iPhone on the corners, allowing for better screen fill of content, bleeding right up into the edges to maximize content again. The Samsung is slightly sharper also with the 500 PPI versus the iPhone has 460 PPI, but then the iPhone hits back with slightly better better brightness coming in at peak 2000 nits versus Samsung's 1750. Now this may not make a difference in day-to-day -day usage, but if you are somebody who uses this phone outside quite a bit, it's it can be noticeable. But wait, holy crap. Okay, I wanna see that one. Sephora body butter attracts spiders. Yeah, okay, I gotta dig into this. This is interesting. Also, a few brownie points to Samsung for building a fingerprint sensor right into the screen, which does come in surprisingly handy a lot of the times. Okay, camera. This is a juicy one, and it definitely gets a lot of people going. The main camera on the iPhone is a 48 megapixel lens versus the 200 megapixel lens on the Samsung. Now, okay, logically, you're probably thinking bigger must be better. Not really the case. Both look fantastic, and to be honest, you're not gonna be able to tell a difference between the two unless you start zooming in quite a bit then in that case the Samsung with their 200 megapixel will be more clear the more you zoom in now in terms of colors the photos on Samsung look a little more saturated and contrasty versus on the iPhone things look a little more natural now when you're talking hardware though for cameras, there's simply an advantage here with versatility for Samsung. Due to its 10X optical zoom, it just has one extra telephoto lens and an actually usable 100X digital zoom. Whereas the iPhone can't really go toe to toe on distance with Samsung over here. However, I would argue that the telephoto lens on the iPhone is a little more usable for me personally, because the iPhone 15 Pro Max now has this 5X telephoto lens, which honestly I am a huge fan of. I think it's fantastic and I actually prefer it to the 3X telephoto lens that we used to have on the iPhone 14 Pro Max. And that's because it actually lends itself to be more of a classical portrait look. There's more background blur, more bokeh, and it just has a more tightly compressed look to it versus with a 3X zoom, it just wasn't zoomed in enough or portrait enough for me to wanna switch over from the main angle lens to the 2X. It is so freaking cold right now. Like I can't even, I can't even do this. I gotta go back in soon. Whew. But where I feel the iPhone really hits back and pretty much blows every phone out of the water is when it comes to video. And the iPhone 15 Pro Max this year took it to another level with their log recording up to 4K 60 frames per second to external SSD using the USB-C connection. Now this has been absolutely incredible for my footage. Like just take a look at some of this stuff that I captured at this Pixel event. I shot this entire video on the iPhone 15 Pro Max and honestly, you can't even tell. Next, let's talk about usage. Okay, I wanna talk about the day-to-day -day experience of using these devices. And to be quite honest with you, it's not as big of a difference as it used to be before. Now, naturally, if you are in the Apple ecosystem, it will benefit you to stay within those walls by having extra continuity features with the iPhone, but the same could also be argued for the other side. Now, if you were to get the Samsung tablets and Samsung laptops and Samsung headphones, then you would have a host of other continuity features that would also sync well with the S23 Ultra. Now, in terms of battery life, it's a bit of a weird one because the 14 Pro Max was 
really bad for me. By the end of the year, I had like 89% battery health and could barely get through a day. And with the 15 Pro Max, it is slightly better, but I'm still not confident that I'll be able to get through a full day of heavy usage. In my personal usage experience, I have to for sure throw this thing on a charger by midnight. And if I have heavier use days where I'm using the camera, doing some gaming and stuff like that, then I gotta juice it up even quicker at like 9 p.m. As for the S23 Ultra, it also gave me a similar experience, although I will say the iPhone felt a bit more efficient in this regard. Okay, so let's bring everything together and share my thoughts on both of these phones, because I mean, even though both of these phones can get super polarizing, they actually have a lot in common. Over the past few years, the S23 Ultra has given me solid battery life throughout the day with no issues. The cameras on the Samsung have also gotten really, really good, where you can't really even tell a difference between between either of these phones. And the ecosystem is also getting much better on Samsung. And I totally forgot to even mention DeX here, but that is a feature that a lot of people use as well. And One UI was their entire saving grace. I mean, it really helped their Android skin look so much better and come out as a more minimal and aesthetic choice. And on the other hand, Apple has also done a lot to bring more customizability to their phones. You have many more possibilities now with widgets and customizing your home pages, your log screens, uh, shortcuts, and your ex overall experience with the phone. The screens have also become some of the best on the market. So at the end of the day, the bottom line is you will kind of be influenced with what products you already own and what your friends and family own as that will make compatibility a lot easier for you. iMessage is apparently still a big deal. I mean, I don't really know why because I pretty much use WhatsApp to stay in touch with friends and family for the most part. Overall, the Samsung feels more like an entertainment device. It's something exciting to use with its creative camera capabilities, the S Pen for markups, and an immersive display that goes edge to edge and folds over just slightly. Unlimited customizability, also giving you multitasking capabilities and greater freedom overall with Android. Whereas over on the iPhone side, the app experience and usability just sometimes seems better. Not only are there more apps available, but the actual aesthetics and the actual user experience on these apps seems to be better on the iPhone. I don't know why, but app designers just tend to do that. Things just feel more fluid, the design elements are more minimal, cleaner, and it gives the iPhone somewhat of a more polished look and feel. That being said, at the end of the day now, it really comes down to you and what your usage and preferences are. I know why you guys stay till the very end, because you want to know about the spiders and the body butter, right? So I did, looked into it and basically like a reviewer posted that they put on this thing, this body butter, I forgot the brand, I'll have it written here. Started using this and then this wolf spider apparently chased them wherever they went, like left, right and everything. So then they posted about this and then a whole bunch of people started speculating. Somebody on Reddit said that it had to do with some like hexadecil fenta, what, it's kind of like pheromones to spiders. The brand said that there's no such thing inside their products and uh, it doesn't attract spiders but who knows really who knows wait what was that noise what is that oh oh sh